In stark contrast, my wife Jessa spends her days hauling alfalfa for the goats, feeding the chickens, pushing around wheelbarrows full of compost and rocks, chopping wood, fixing fences, planting trees, raking, shoveling, pulling weeds, gardening. I'll admit, I'm a bit jealous of her routine because she spends most of the day in the sunshine and fresh air, working with her hands in an ancestral way. But at the end of the day, we both achieved a similar amount of low-level physical activity. Think about it like this. Unless you're a professional athlete, one of our primary goals in life is to train for and complete a triathlon, obstacle course race, CrossFit qualification, or some other modern-day equivalent of a battle that requires you to train like a warrior, visiting the gym at some point during the day should be an option, not a necessity. Research backs this up, showing that it doesn't matter how hard you exercise at the beginning or end of the day if you have your butt planted in a chair for eight continuous hours during the rest of the day. 6. Prioritize social engagement. In most of the blue zones, strong relationships come naturally because social connectedness is ingrained in the culture. Compared to most hyper-connected Western societies, they tend to be much more engaged with, conscientious toward, and helpful to each other, and more willing to empathize, express feelings, and wear their emotions on their sleeves. For example, Okinawans have Moais, which are groups of friends and families who live together their entire lives, spending time talking, cooking together, and supporting each other. Sardinians often finish their days in the local bar, where they meet their friends for a glass of red wine. Seventh-day Adventists in California mingle with one another weekly or even daily during religious services and the observation of the Sabbath. Family is also very important for people living in blue zones. For example, during their day-long Sabbath celebration each week, the Seventh-day Adventists focus on family, God, socializing, and spending time in nature. Nursing homes and hospice care are rare in the blue zones because people are expected to honor, value, and take care of the elderly especially older family members. As a result of their pivotal role in society, elders are far more likely to have a social network, frequent visitors, and trusted caregivers, resulting in less stress, more purposeful lives, and ultimately a longer lifespan. As a matter of fact, I feel that the pros of prioritizing social relationships and family dinners, even if it means occasionally staying out past your bedtime or eating late at night, outweigh the cons of possible disruptions to your circadian rhythm, especially because you can limit nighttime artificial light exposure by donning a pair of blue light blocking glasses or consuming a family dinner by candlelight. 7. Drink low to moderate amounts of alcohol, especially wine. In four of the five blue zones, people engage in moderate and regular alcohol consumption. Take the Sardinians, for example. They're famous for their regular consumption of a regional red wine called Canada, a dry wine that contains two to three times the flavonoid content of other wines. Not familiar with Cananao? It's known elsewhere and more popularly as Grenache. Consuming wine with or before a meal can improve the absorption of the artery-scrubbing flavonoid antioxidants in the wine, and studies have shown that the consumption of wine as part of a Mediterranean diet can reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancers. Regular low-level physical activity boosts these benefits even more. According to a study performed by the European Society of Cardiology, moderate wine drinking and regular physical activity is a potent combination for cardiovascular disease prevention. Indeed, Sardinian shepherds often walk up to five miles a day to tend to their flocks and carry along a lunch of unleavened bread, fava beans, pecorino cheese, and a local Cananao wine. You're no doubt familiar with resveratrol, polyphenol found in the skin of grapes that may protect the body against the oxidative damage that increases the risk of cancer, heart disease, and dementia. Resveratrol can also combat the formation of the plaque found in the brains of dementia patients. This may be why the weekly consumption of alcohol is associated with better cognitive function in old age. Plenty of additional research backs up the link between wine intake, reduced stress, and longevity. And as I'll explain later in this chapter, certain compounds very similar to resveratrol can be used in a more concentrated supplement form. This type of frequent, moderate alcohol consumption is one of my own nightly habits, most often accomplished by a digestive and bitters-rich Moscow mule, a shot of a clean-burning alcohol, such as gin or vodka or rocks, with a splash of lemon and a hefty dose of bitters, a drink that I affectionately call the Ben and Jitters, or a glass of organic, biodynamic red wine. 
associated in multiple studies with better weight management and slow aging, as well as a reduced risk of diseases related to metabolic health, such as type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. But for active athletes, exercise enthusiasts, or people who already have a healthy body fat percentage, long-term CR can have some downsides, particularly making one cold and hungry because of a drop in metabolism and lean muscle mass. Who wants to live a long time if you have low libido and look like a poster child for an anti-starvation campaign? Sure, if your goal is rapid weight loss, or if you're morbidly obese with lots of stored fat to burn, CR is a good strategy to accelerate fat loss. But even that strategy should be combined with periods of time during which you provide your body with ample calories and nutrients, such as a weekly refeed. Intermittent fasting is probably the most popular way to get the benefits of caloric restriction without starving yourself. At its most basic, intermittent fasting simply involves alternating cycles of eating and fasting, but the term encompasses many kinds of fasting, including these. Time-restricted feeding, consuming all food within a 3-12 to 12 hour window each day, so you fast for at least 12 hours daily. Alternate day fasting, fasting for 24 hours, then eating normally for 24 hours, then fasting for 24 hours again, and so on. Eat, stop, eat. Fasting for 24 hours once or twice per week. Fasting mimicking diet. Consuming small amounts of food, about 40% of your usual calories for three to five consecutive days. Feast, famine, cycle. Eating according to the seasonal availability of foods. Warrior diet. Fasting during the day and eating a huge meal at night. I'll talk in more detail about a fasting mimicking diet feast famine cycling later in this chapter. Research suggests that in mice, intermittent fasting can prevent and reverse obesity and metabolic problems even when the mice eat an unhealthy diet. Researchers at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies performed an experiment that appeared in the journal Cell Metabolism. During the 38-week study, the scientists fed groups of adult male mice one of the following diets. High fat, high fructose, high fat and high fructose, and regular mouse food. The caloric intake for each group was the same, but in each group, some of the mice could eat whenever they wanted, while others were restricted to feeding periods of 9, 12, or 15 hours. On weekends, some of the time-restricted mice were allowed to cheat and eat whenever they chose. Halfway through the study, a few of the unrestricted mice were moved to the time-restricted groups. By the end of the study, the unrestricted mice of each diet group were obese and metabolically ill. On the other hand, each diet group's mice that were restricted to 9 or 12 hours of feeding per day were lean and healthy, even if they'd been allowed to cheat on the weekends. In addition, the unrestricted mice that were moved to the time-restricted groups had lost some of the weight that they had gained. In other words, it doesn't matter whether a diet is high fat, high sugar, or both, or whether the diet is high calorie. The most effective factor in maintaining a lean body is eating all of a day's meals within a short period, preferably somewhere in the range of 8 to 12 hours every day. Research also suggests that intermittent fasting is effective in people, promoting fat loss and improving insulin sensitivity. Fasting also allows your gut to heal if you've been consuming gluten, gliadin, or other gut irritants, although these benefits, and the many longevity-related benefits of fasting, reach peak effectiveness after 16 hours of fasting. Centenarians in locations like Nicoya, Sardinia, and Okinawa are unlikely to use fasting-related terms like time-restricted feeding, but they do tend to eat relatively small portions of whole foods, consuming a low to moderate calorie diet by being mindful of their hunger and avoiding calorie-dense, fat- and sugar-laden processed and packaged foods. Okinawans practice the traditional cultural rule of hara hachi which means eating until they're about 80% full. Most meals are consumed within an 8-12 to 12 hour window, referred to by researchers as a compressed feeding window, which perfectly matches the new 16-8 diet. So why do all of these different forms of fasting seem to work so well? The most recent research on fasting suggests that it all comes down to mitochondria, the tiny cellular power plants. Inside our cells, mitochondrial networks generally alternate between fused and fragmented states. Calorie-restricted diets and fasting promote homeostasis.
homeostasis and induce a healthy fluctuation between fused and fragmented states, allowing mitochondria to live longer by cycling between a natural growth and repair process. They also increase fatty acid oxidation, which leads to fewer free radicals and less damage to your cells and the mitochondria contained within them. In chapter 12, I detailed my own daily and weekly fasting practices, which are designed to make sure that I get adequate nutrients for my active lifestyle, and explained who should be particularly careful in their approach to fasting. Later in this chapter, we'll talk about my two favorite longer-term fasting practices. My podcast with Dr. Jason Fung, linked to at boundlessbook.com slash 19, is an excellent resource that takes a deep dive into fasting, as is Dr. Fung's comprehensive book, The Complete Guide to Fasting. Later in this chapter, I outline in detail two of my favorite forms of longer-term fasting. 9. Possess a strong life purpose. An 11-year NIH-funded study that investigated the correlation between having a sense of purpose and longevity showed that those who expressed a clear purpose for their life lived longer than those who did not, and those with purpose also stayed immersed in activities and communities involved in fulfilling that purpose. This idea of purpose is even expressed in idiomatic terms in blue zones. Okinawans refer to purpose as ikigai, translated as reason for being, and Nikoyans call it plan de vida, or reason to live. I recommend that you know your purpose and be able to express it in one succinct sentence. My purpose in life is to empower people to live an adventurous, joyful, and fulfilling life. Need help identifying your purpose? A manual to identifying your life's purpose, such as Mast and Kip's Claim Your Power, for help. If you want to begin as simply as possible, start with my friend Mark Manson's advice and simply choose to do stuff that makes you forget to eat and poop. 10. Have low amounts of stress. It's a well-known and heavily researched fact that chronic stress leads to inflammation and serves as the foundation for nearly every age-related disease. Centenarians and most of the world's longevity hotspots do not avoid all stress, but do have built-in systems that allow them to manage stress on a daily basis. For Sardinians, this might mean having a glass of wine or a social dinner with family or friends at the end of the day. For Seventh-day Adventists, it could involve a quiet nature walk on the Sabbath. For Okinawans, it is the concept of tege, translated as easygoing personality which is based on the idea that life simply unfolds at its own pace. In Okinawa, if an event is scheduled to begin at noon, tege may mean that people on Okinawa time begin showing up 30 minutes to an hour later. This isn't something that I would recommend if you want to keep your job, but you get the idea. Ruthlessly eliminate haste and hurry from your life. For the best stress-reducing tips, including breathwork strategies, my most potent tactic for stress, which relies on zero supplements or fancy hacks, revisit Chapter 3. One breathing concept that was not explored in Chapter 3 is quite fascinating and directly tied to longevity. My friend and former podcast guest Anders Wilson has studied animals' lifespans in relation to their energy expenditure, metabolism, and oxygen utilization. In his fantastic blog post, Breathe Less, Live Longer, he notes that a common denominator for long-lived species such as the naked mole rat, the bat, the short-beaked echidna, the bowhead whale, and the Greenland shark is that they have slow respiration and a high tolerance for carbon dioxide, or CO2. A fast and shallow breathing pattern corresponds to low CO2 tolerance, while deep relaxation and breathing low and slow corresponds to a high tolerance for carbon dioxide. Anders teaches two ways to increase the levels of carbon dioxide in your body. 
spiritual discipline or religion or believe in a higher power. In chapter 15, I described how much more meaningful and hopeful life can be when we believe that our story has a great author of a Catholic faith, rather than believing that everything we see and experience is meaningless and without purpose, or that we're simply a bunch of chunks of spiritless flesh and blood floating through space on a giant rock before eventually dying and passing away into nothingness. While many would scoff at the belief that there are gods and demons, spirits and angels, and even one single almighty creator of the planet, research has shown a connection between longevity and faith. One study analyzed the relationship between religious practice, stress, and death in middle age, and controlled for socioeconomic factors, health insurance status, and healthy behavior. The researchers found that churchgoers have a significantly lower risk of dying, and after adjusting for age, sex, race, and chronic medical conditions, churchgoers were 46% less likely to die in the follow-up period after the study compared to non-churchgoers. Non-churchgoers had significantly higher rates of blood pressure and a higher ratio of total cholesterol to HDL cholesterol, along with a significantly higher mortality rate. It turns out that data from the Blue Zones backs this up. All but five of the 263 centenarians Dan Buechner interviewed for his book belong to some faith-based community. Research also shows that attending faith-based services at least four times per month can add four to 14 years to life expectancy. In all Blue Zones, centenarians were part of a religious community. I can't sum it up any better than Buechner, who concluded that, quote, People who pay attention to their spiritual side have lower rates of cardiovascular disease, depression, stress, and suicide, and their immune systems seem to work better. To a certain extent, adherence to a religion allows them to relinquish the stresses of everyday life to a higher power. In the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 recommends that we cast all our cares upon Him, and in multiple other verses of the Bible, we're told not to be so stressed about the common things the rest of the world tends to fret about, like food, water, and shelter. Being able to trust in and talk to a higher power is certainly something that has given me a great deal of hope, confidence, clarity, peace, and direction in my life. Quite frankly, I believe that a religious practice that includes spiritual disciplines such as fasting, meditation, prayer, silence, solitude, worship, and study contributes even more significantly to longevity than a salad of wild plants, a glass of red wine, or a dose of sunshine. If I had to choose just one section of the Bible that best explains how to optimize your health and longevity through simple religious practices and common sense morality, it would be Proverbs chapter 3. I keep a four-minute audio recording of this chapter on my MP3 player and listen to it at least once per week. 12. Remain reproductively useful. This last natural strategy for optimizing longevity simply makes logical sense. Don't become reproductively useless. In other words, the more consistently you can send your body and brain the message that you're still a valuable and contributing member of society, particularly when it comes to the propagation of your species, the longer nature will want to keep you around. Don't retire. Don't quit learning new things. Don't surround yourself with older, sedentary people in a nursing home or hospice setting. Instead, continue to have sex, have children, or both. Take, for example, the tiny town of Acciaroli, Italy, where one in eight citizens is over 100 years old. The elders in this particular blue zone are not your average centenarians. They're healthy, consistently happy, and, you guessed it, horny. In the findings of a recent study on why these residents live so long is the observation that sex is rampant among them. Incidentally, the study also noted that the high consumption of parsley, sage, and rosemary, all of which are aphrodisiacs, is prevalent in this region. Let's take a closer look at what research...